This will be your only warning. You know, as much as these director's cuts are getting out of hand, yeah, I could get into this. Last week I was talking about the messy and convenient plot of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, especially with how they brought in Zemo and Sharon Carter. You know, as much as I wanted this show to go in some dark places, I'm kind of happy that it's just going to be like zany and fun and... Um... Ooh, not what I was expecting, but here we are. Hey! Let's hear it for Captain America! Hello, my name is Brandon, and welcome to another spoiler review for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This time for episode four, arguably the best one of the series. So far. This is also supposedly the episode right before the one that's supposed to make us all cry. Which, I don't really know where else they could go, seeing as how I was crying in the first five minutes. Anyone else? Just me? Cool, cool, just me. Alright, cool. The opening of this episode is an example of why I love these Disney Plus Marvel shows so much. It's allowing us to delve deeper into these characters that otherwise wouldn't have been given the spotlight. First with Wanda and Vision in WandaVision, and now with Sam and Bucky, especially especially Bucky, seeing part of the time that he spent in Wakanda, recovering from his broken, brainwashed mind. And everybody in this show is absolutely on point, but Sebastian Stan especially is killing it. I've said it before, but Bucky has always been displayed as a character that we're supposed to care about, but never actually showed us why we should care about him, except seeing his importance through Steve's eyes. This show is allowing us to finally fall in love with this character that for the longest time we were just told that he's important damn near bringing tears to my eyes almost every episode now this opening sequence also sets the stage for how wakanda plays a role in this show sort of acting like the through line kind of like how black panther was in captain america civil war part of me thinks that this sequence initially intended to have chadwick boseman rest in peace but given that it's io it paints the picture that bucky is in some massive debt to wakanda for treating him and damn near saving his life and the fact that he broke Zemo out of prison, you know, the person that killed King T'Chaka, it's no wonder that the Wakandans and the Dora Milaje feel betrayed. So their involvement makes sense. It doesn't feel forced. Them coming after Zemo later on in the episode feels warranted. And of course, their instincts point in the right direction and attack John Walker and Hoskins too. This is one of the many differences between Steve and John Walker. At least Steve respected royalty. The Dora Milaje don't have jurisdiction here. Not to worry. I have a permit. This just says... The Dora Milaje have jurisdiction wherever the Dora Milaje find themselves to be. I think we got off on the wrong foot. Activate instant kill! We should do something. Maybe this whole interaction will teach you to, uh, you know not mess with the Dora Milaje, you know, the army of the most heavily guarded country on the planet. Come on, even they know how to use the shield better than you, Mr. Walker. Leave it. I think Bucky made the right original choice not getting involved here. And listen, if you are going to get involved using the mechanical arm that they designed, maybe you should read the manual first. Okay, how much for the arm? Oh, I'll get that up. This series, and more specifically this episode, really revolves around the question, do the ends justify the means? It's brought up a handful of times throughout this series, and a handful of times in this episode alone. I think it's a proper question to ask. Does Zemo's end goal justify his means? You know... Does his means of luring children with candy justify his end goal? I think the only thing he was missing was a white van. Or does his end goal of ridding the world of super soldiers justify his means of trying to kill Carly? Does Carly's end goal of restoring the world justify her means of killing so many people? This question could be asked about anybody. John Walker wanting to be the best Captain America that he can be. Does that justify his means in violent acts that he commits? Does Sharon's end goal, whatever that may be, justify her means of 
what is it that she's doing? She was being shady last episode and she continues to be shady now. Is she working for the power broker? She seems to know a lot about him. I mean, I guess maybe the city being flipped on its head because of the power broker's anger doesn't necessarily mean that she's involved. I'm not going to say it, but she's involved or she is the power broker. I mean, that would be crazy, but what are us Marvel fans if not crazy? I am really hoping that's not the case. I hope they don't pull another Ralph Boner on us and have Sharon be the power broker. What a big reveal. We literally just did this song and dance in WandaVision. Who is Ralph? We haven't met Ralph yet. Get it. Just come on, give us a new character. You want to tussle again? Hmm? But all of these characters and their different motives intersecting with each other and clashing against one another, it's so fascinating to me that the lines between hero and villain are really quite blurred. No, not like that. The ideologies between some of these characters really align with one another. Take the Flag Smashers and Sam, for example. While the Flag Smashers end goal is warranted, it makes sense. Their means of doing so are morally wrong. The difference is, is that Sam wants the same thing, equality and unity, but wouldn't go about it the same way that Carly is. This is also a primary difference with how John Walker approaches situations. He's going about things the wrong way, and also for the wrong reasons. How do you want the rest of this conversation to go, Sam, huh? Should I put down the shield, make it fair? At the end of the day, it's to fuel his ego, to make him feel like he's doing a good job at being Captain America. But what kind of symbol like Captain America does the America of today actually need? I didn't think there could be another Captain America until I met you. Now, back then, it was just good and bad. But the world's more complicated now. People are lost. They need a leader who looks like them, who understands their pain. Someone who understands that today's heroes don't have the luxury of keeping their hands clean. While he's describing his perspective of Carly, he's also doing a good job at describing Sam, another way that Sam and Carly's ideologies align. That shield has too much bad history and too much bad blood on it, literally, for it to be represented as a symbol of hope in this America. Because while Steve Rogers embodied that hope and optimism that America needed in the 1940s, America is different today. And unfortunately, Zemo even said it best. But there has never been another Steve Rogers, has there? Every attempt at recreating Captain America has gone horribly wrong. Take Blonsky, for example, in The Incredible Hulk, or even Bruce Banner himself, or any of the Super Soldiers or the Winter Soldiers. Bucky might be on the right side now, but for 90 years was used as a weapon. Even Isaiah Bradley's experiences with the serum resulted in an innocent man put behind bars. There's always some sort of negative result or horrific outcome from recreating these super soldiers. The Flag Smashers stealing the serum and John Walker's recent decision to take the serum are just the latest example. The super soldier serum enhances everything that makes up a person. Inherently good, like Steve Rogers, becomes exceptionally good. Inherently flawed, like John Walker, well... Bent becomes worse. If it wasn't clear before, this episode solidifies the differences between Steve and John, and also John and Sam. Because a strong man who has known power all his life may lose respect for that power, but a weak man knows the value of strength and knows compassion. Whatever happens tomorrow, you must promise me one thing, that you will stay who you are. Not a perfect soldier, but a good men. While yes, John Walker claims to have jumped on grenades like Steve Rogers, it was a calculated response. Yeah, actually I have four times. It's the thing I do with my helmet. It's a reinforced helmet. It's a long story. Steve threw his own body on the grenade. Every situation that Steve Rogers came in conflict with, he was reserved. He used his abilities to put a stop to people, but not kill them. I'm also not saying that Sam is Steve Rogers, because he's not. Sam is Sam, but better suited to hold that shield than John Walker ever could be. The differences between John Walker and Sam Wilson and how they approach situations is the perfect example of just that. Sam's approach to reasoning with Carly was level-headed. It was tame. He just simply wanted to talk to her, to understand her perspective, which he did, until John Walker comes in like a bull in a china shop. Well, oh, that's a bad example. Bulls don't actually break stuff in china shops. Mythbusters taught me that <laughs> they're very careful of the break in china sam had complete control of the situation until john intervened he's too 
reactionary. And that's not what America needs. Had a lot of problems with people being reactionary in this country. Well, I think we're doing all right. Is that a trick question? And one of the biggest differences between Sam and John is the choice to take the super soldier serum. When Zemo asks Sam if he would take it, given the opportunity, without hesitation, he would not. Because he doesn't need it. He's a strong person on his own. Whereas John Walker feels like he needs it. Getting his ass kicked by the Flag Smashers, getting his ass kicked by the Dora Milaje, because he's untamed. He blindly fights without any sort of planning. So without any sort of abilities, he feels weak. Yeah. After all, why not? Why shouldn't I keep it? While it's not specifically shown that he took it, I think we're given enough reasoning to assume that he did. Did you just take it? I assume you just took it. While John Walker paints himself as the hero, he is one bad day away from becoming the villain. And this was that day, with Hoskins, his trusted ally, and the only person that was trying to reason with him, dead. I don't agree with it, but... Can't say I'm surprised with how he reacted. And this final big difference in parallel to Steve Rogers is Steve knew when to stop. Hey. Well, that just about does it. America is officially fucked. Ah, is this your king? Huh? Is this your king? If you liked hearing me talk about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, be sure to subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you can stay up to date with any of the content I release on my channel. And if you'd like, you can also check out my reaction to the episode. I film a live reaction every Friday morning. Usually comes out the day after, day before, sometime around when this is released. I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. But there'll be a link in the bio if you want to check that out. You can also come follow me over on Twitter at BMattWeiss. Come yell at me about this and anything that I talk about on my channel. Follow me over on twitch.tv slash box the wise. I'm not over there yet, but I will be. So go ahead on over there just to get yourself situated and I will meet you there. Last but not least, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to share it. Help me get to 100 subscribers by next month. I need your help to do so. So tell your friends, tell your family, tell your grandmother. I don't know what she likes, but let's build this community together because I enjoy talking to every single one of you. And thanks so much for watching. And until next time, America. Fuck yeah. Burning the flag cause our name is John Walker. Thanks a lot. Bye. For those at home keeping score, Barnacle and I are on good terms now. Isn't that right, Barnacle?